Art has played a paramount role, not only in documenting and telling the stories of the revolutions and social movements of the Middle East and North Africa, but also in driving people towards change, both regionally and globally. Whether, whether graffiti, music, or the spoken word, art has mobilized demographics historically unknown for their political activation. The online space has only underscored this further, providing platforms for the power of art to touch wide multitudes, and even carving out space for diaspora artists to continue contributing to this cultural movement. As countries in the MENA region find themselves in consequential moments of transition, be it popular mobilization or democrat democratic reversal, in the midst of this influx of change, we ask ourselves, what role has art played over the last decade? How have artists moved their work online for documentation because of reprisal or due to the pandemic? And what role will art continue to play going forward? Hello, I'm Rami Yakub, Executive Director of the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy, also known as TIMEP. We are thrilled to be hosting and facilitating this conversation at Rights, RightsCon 2022 on the power of art in mobilizing social movements, particularly in the Middle East and North Africa. We've seen the immense capability of art to move people to join social movements in pursuit of indispensable rights and freedoms and to inspire them to imagine a different world than the one to which they've become accustomed. We've also seen how threatened many governments in the region are by flourishing art and free expression particularly during times of social and political transition, and how they have sought to silence various forms of art, lest they be catalyst for true change. And on the flip side, we've seen how governments and regimes have, in many cases successfully, not only stifled independent art, but tame art to serve its agenda and promote its message, turning the art space, in many cases, to be only political. Countries in the MENA region are no longer facing the same levels of reprisal and find themselves at vastly different stages of transition. To help us understand the past, present, and future of the role of art in the socio-political MENA space, today I'm joined by Ahmed Negi, journalist, writer, documentary filmmaker, with more than 15 years of experience in covering the art and digital media market in the Middle East. Ahmed's work has been featured in the Rolling Stones, New York Times, LA Times, and many other media outlets. He was awarded the Penn Barbie Freedom to Write Award from Pan America. Currently, he is a city asylum fellow at the Black Mountain Institute at UNLV. His next book, Reading and Writing in Prison, will be out next year from McSweeney's Publishing House. Next, I'm joined by Khaled El Bey, a Sudanese artist and political cartoonist, publishing his work on international blogs, social media, websites, under the name Khartoum, a wordplay on Khartoum and Khartoum, obviously the capital of Sudan. Khaled is one of the most prolific political cartoonists in the world. And for 20 years, he published a piece of artwork every day. And last but not least, Dana Ash, a Lebanese cultural and social activist, feminist, playwright, performance poet, and the founder and executive director of the nonprofit arts organization Haven for Artists based in Beirut, Lebanon. I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. And I was thinking we'd start off and frame the conversation not only by comparing the different countries you all come from, but rather to think critically about the past, present and future of the kinds of expressions we'll be discussing today. And with that said, I'm gonna pick on you Khaled, start with you. Uh, I want to ask you, as Sudan is going through um, several years of upheaval now, from its revolution to overthrow dictator al-Bashir, to currently ongoing efforts to resist the military coup, what kind of art forms have you seen flourish um, and the kind of conversation that art inspires, um, if you can tell us a little bit about that? I, I think you're muted, Khaled. Sorry about that. Uh, after a, a year of COVID, you think you'll get used to uh, Zoom. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, um, jumping in, I think uh, Sudan, like many other revolutions and like all revolutions really used art to um, reflect on the street, on society, right? And 
you could you could see that from a year prior to the revolution in 2018, the the young protesters were mostly young girls, and uh, I've seen I've seen this scene with my own hand with my own eyes. It was it was really uh, two girls wearing their hijabs at night, have a backpack, and they had spray paints with them, right? And they just ran really quickly. Yasqut Bas, which was the, the 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 theme of the revolution, which means just just fall, just go, and just put it back and ran. This is this is at night in Sudan, and it was two young girls. And this is how it continued until today. So this, this revolution was basically led by women, led by art, and this quick graffiti of Tasqat Bas, with the revolution advancing, with the coup happening, sorry, with the, with the, uh, um, uh, the fall of al-Bashir, until now the coup happening, you can see the development of that Tasqat Bas with the quick graffiti to an, a proper art. You know, people took their time, they stood in the street and they do it, you know, they, they took their time making that art piece. And this is what's going on until now. And a big part of the revolution until today is poetry. Every day, uh, every mokib, every uh, uh, protest that, that goes out, you, you see young people gathering and reciting poetry. And it became a huge theme of the revolution. It's, it's known poetry by known uh, poets like Azhar Muhammad Ali and so on. And it's also the songs that came out in support of, of, of the revolution by Ayman Mao, by, you know, it was, it was totally different themes. So you would find one very traditional, uh, you know, kind of song. And then you will find like uh, reggae and, you know, rap and, and, and so on. So, it took all forms of, of, of shapes, really, but most strongly it was definitely the graffiti. And it was like, it's like you dropped a paint bomb on Khartoum. And Khartoum is usually a very, you know, it's a very dry city. It's very, very gray desert. And with, with the revolution, it's just, you know, everything just turned into color. And you could see kind of like the um, pinnacle of that was during the sit-in in, 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 in the Atasam. Uh, which was the sitting in front of the of the army HQ, and that was basically the main ideal of how Khartoum should look, how Sudan should look. And it was. Can, it was, can I touch you for a moment and tell the yeah. audience when was the sit in? And please continue your thought, but let, let yeah. the audience know. Yeah, yeah. The sit in was was right before the fall of uh, of Omar al Bashir, which is, was in uh, 2019, and. Uh, the, the, the sit-in was, of course, uh, attacked by the army at the end, and it was, it was, it was a massacre uh, that we kind of uh, memorate uh, two days ago, actually, on the, 3rd of, on the 3rd of June. So that sit-in was every corner. There was art. There was artists. There was, uh, there was four stages put up. There was always shows going on. It was, it's exactly like you know, what you would have seen in Tahrir Square 10 years ago, you know? And that, that, that memory of that still sticks today, you know, th three years later. And this is what they're trying to do until today. These protests are always trying to create another, another sit-in. They want Sudan to be another sit-in. So definitely poetry, uh, uh, all sorts of art were involved in the revolution and still are. Uh, sadly though, the army, uh, Hemeti, which is the, 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 um, the, the, um, the leader of the infamous Janjaweed forces who, who committed the crime of uh, uh, at the sit-in, they are trying to buy most of the artists. And the, the problem is the artists can't support themselves right now, you know, like many people in Sudan. So most of the artists used to work basically at, uh, you know, doing UN jobs, gra graphic design, blah, 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 you know, most of these things just to make days, days meet. And then they will do their own work, right, for resistance, for, for creativity and all of that. And now there's no, there's no other jobs. There's, there's very... Um, um, it's there's a few people that are working right now because of the coup situation that happened because of the economical situation in Sudan. So, from experience, I know this uh, a brilliant video artist actually who was documenting the 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 revolutions from 2018 until today, and he disappeared for a while. And I was looking for him, trying to like figure out where he is, what's up, blah blah blah, you know, trying to get get in touch with him. And at the end, he got in touch with me from a different number. And he's like, listen, I've been, I've been trying to hide because the, the Jinjui, they're basically asking if I can work with them. And you know what would happen if I say no. And I don't, I don't, I don't know what to do. I, I don't have money. I can't fix my computer, blah, 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 blah. 
So supporting the art and supporting the artist is 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 one thing that I really should uh, really emphasize on. I've been trying to emphasize on in everything that I've written and everything that I've drawn. And it's, it's, we need to support art and artists because that's part of the continuity of, of democracy and supporting democracy. If you can't have free speech, if you can't have free, free creativity to do what you want to do, to show the street that this is happening, you really, you really can't. And I still remember, just one last thing, I, just still, I still remember the first thing in, 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 um, uh, when Libya started, there was, a, there was a graffiti of a cartoon of, 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 of uh, Gaddafi on the wall and people were throwing shoes at it. I still remember that. And this is when really everything took off because this is when you know that the fear is broken. When you can criticize on the street, when there's, when there's, there's this well-maintained work, people st stood there and worked without, without fear. This is democracy. Oh, that's like an excellent reminder. Thank you so much. Um, and with that said, let me turn over to Ahmed. Ahmed, I'm sure you could tell that I stole a few of your words in my introduction with regards to how um, governments have sometimes taken over the space for uh, uh, for art at large. But let me just ask you directly, having lived the Egyptian experience and have seen firsthand the evolution of the process of documentation for over a decade, documentation of art and, and freedom of expression, could you tell us briefly about the role of art in the in the, the social movement in Egypt, uh, also what sort of environment was that art and free expression um, circulated at the time compared to now, um, and most importantly, how has the documentation uh, of that art survived or not uh, on the various online platforms? Uh, thank you, Rami, and hello, everyone. Uh, so it's uh, so refreshing to hear Khaled's voice and his enthusiasm about what's going in Sudan, because like, it's like we are 10 years posted. So we are living in a different moment a little bit. But um, answering your question, answer your question. So there is there is two rules that art, especially on internet and platform and social media played. First, it was distributing awareness. Uh, if you remember for the Egyptian revolution, it started to end torture and dehumanizing the human body. And so we were publishing on the internet, we were publishing all these videos that commenting torturing that had been committed by police officer and so on. Now, to the, comparing to now, you can do this anymore, not because of security reason, but because of algorithm and, and policy of this social media network. Like, for example, if we remember like six or eight months ago, there was like a video that was shot into like one of the police stations showing torturing happening. And uh, no one could upload this video in Facebook, for example. And when you try to upload it in YouTube, what the government will do is they will use one of their media company who will go and claim that they own the copyright of the video and then take it out. And I remember very well, even during the revolution, and this, this problem contained until now, like I remember during the revolution, uh, there weren't any internet in Tahrir Square. So we had like a media hubs in the Tahrir who were people who were like have photos and videos on their phone or their camera. They came and gave us their memory card and then we will go outside the Tahrir Square and upload it. So you have a huge amount of, of archives that documenting what was going on the street. And this archive doesn't exist anymore. Because again, starting from 2014, after the military coup, one of the aspects that the government worked on is to use their, med with their media companies to go and claim this video and to erase it from the internet and to hidden it. So, and here is a problem that we are facing, and I'm speaking here for, for people who are interested in freedom of expression, and even like media companies and, 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 and Silicon Valley's companies. We are facing a huge problem here and a huge question that this is an archive that belongs to if to all people, to the Egyptian people. And this archive, no one has access to it now. Like if I am a historian who wants to do a research on the Egyptian revolution, I need to see this archive. This archive is only exists now on YouTube server, but it's not, it's, it's hidden. And YouTube will claim, oh, it's this archive, there is this media company who claims that they own this archive or own these videos. Of course, this media doesn't own it, but on the other hand, no one will claim, oh, I pictured or I did, I shoot this video for a police officer torturing a guy and I own the copyright of it. 
So the question for here is what about the people right to access to information and to archive? And when YouTube and all this media will free like all this archive, because in the end, this archive belongs to the Sudanese people, to the Egyptian people. And I'm afraid like after a couple of years, we will not find the Sudanese archive even. Uh, uh, um, so this is the first rule. The second rule that social media played was like to help people to organize. And of course now this become impossible uh, because this social media, especially Facebook, uh, uh, are collaborating, collaborating with the government. Uh, they are sharing user information. We saw like even other media companies like Uber, uh, uh, who's working in Egypt, they signed a deal with the Egyptian government to be able to say, to, to share their their, their user information and because of this happened because this happened with like western and, and 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 american companies so user now to organize themselves to go to russian application and russian software like telegram for example uh, 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 um, and 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 that's mean we are losing market in the future the other step that also China is taking over uh, North Africa and Middle and Middle East. They are basically engulfing it. And, and here I'm talking about the only good things that happened in the last five or 10 years is that because of these platforms like YouTube, Spotify, uh, Netflix, and so on and so on, it created a new market for artists in Egypt and North Africa. So now if I am an artist, if I'm a musician, I could record my music, upload it on Spotify and making money out of it. So suddenly in the last five years, we have a new wave of, of music and filmmaker and, and even like graphic designer who will show their work, who will sell their work through the internet and be able to gain money and, and continue working and distributing, and distributing their work without go, going through the government censorship. However, this market is still, there is there's still a lot of financial problem because the money you will get through Spotify and YouTube, you get it through bank accounts. So first you must have a bank account. Not all Egyptians have a bank account. Uh, so they depend on agency. Like uh, there will be all, all of these artists will have agency and agency will take the money from YouTube and then give them percentage. However, on the other hand, Chinese platform like TikTok and the other application, they establish when they enter the market like Egypt, they establish an Asian network. Like there will be an office for TikTok in Cairo. And in every city, in every village, they will have an agent. And this agent will go to people. Like I remember when TikTok entered Egypt, they will, in, in our village in Mansoura, there will be uh, two guys who work as an agent for TikTok. And they will go to people and tell, ask them to the, download the application and to do like nine video. If you did a nine video, it will give you like 600 pounds. So the technique that the Chinese application are using, especially in, in market like North Africa and, and and Egypt is, 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 is taking over the market and taking over the people. And of course, this, this application is work under the regulation of the Chinese Communist Party and the Egyptian and the African government, which in the end creates a situation that we, we, we saw in the last two years where like the Egyptian government go and arrest several girls. Last year was arrested and sentenced for two years last uh, last week because the girl was just doing an, an TikTok videos. And the funny thing is that is when the first case of TikTok girls happened in Egypt, the Egyptian government went and, uh, and arrested the gear and arrested all the agents that working in the companies. The Chinese ambassador went on and visited the Egyptian general prosecutor. They took off their agent. The gear was sentenced for 10 years, for 10 years. Um, but the Chinese were able to get their agent out. Um, and they signed a deal even with the general prosecutor to, to make sure that they will follow the laws, that they will give them uh, the user information and so on and so on. Uh, so this is like the scene now, as I see it in, in Egypt and North Africa. Yeah, no, thank you, Ahmed. I mean, I'm glad also you're shedding light on the, the, the horrific TikTok cases in Egypt where girls are being charged under human trafficking law uh, for posting videos on, on TikTok. Uh, and I'm definitely going to get back to you on the China and the, the involvement of China in the region after we get to, to, to Dana. Um, 
And Dana, I would love for you to introduce us to some of the work that um, Haven for Artists does and how it's preparing uh, artists and activists um, to, you know, for the world and um, for the future of Lebanon. If you can give us a little bit, a little bit about that, I'd, we'd love to hear from you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Dana Ash, and I'm the executive director of Haven for Artists, but I'm also a writer on the side, which I might go off script, so to speak, although I'm a writer. Um, to start off on some of the things that Haven does, uh, we've, <clears throat> we've been organized as, as a collective since 2011 and registered as an organization since 2017 because of Lebanon's clientelism and, and the way that the secretarian system is structured. If you don't have a backing, you don't get registered. There's no way for you to like go through pure bureaucratic processes, transparency. So there's always a, a lot of... Uh, smoke and mirrors and things. So it took us a very long time to be able to register, especially since our work focuses on women in LGBTQI, um, whether it be endorsing um, campaigns or movements or supporting artists and activists that are otherwise excluded from the public support sphere or excluded from spaces in which they can speak about their experiences and so on and so forth. So for Fairhaven, um, originally we became as a pop-up, a platform to bring artists together and to kind of shy away from the competitive corporate scheme, uh, not shy away, but to run away from the corporate scheme of you know, monopolizing artists and their artwork and putting them against each other in order to achieve whatever little means of resources that are even available, being that it's all a trickle down system in the first place. So we first started off with pop-up events, bringing artists together. And as time progressed, we opened our first cultural center, which had a residency for four artists. And then within uh, two years, we expanded to a second house, which would had a residency and a shelter program for artists and activists escaping persecution from all over the MENA region. And then now, thirdly, we are in our third house because we had to close our first and second because Lebanon's landscape are, um, let's just say, we are very known in Lebanon for not taking on one crisis at a time. So we, of course, while the world was suffering from the COVID-19 pandemic, Lebanon was also adding on a crippling debt, uh, a massive financial crisis, and the Beirut port explosion, which is the third non-nuclear explosion to ever hit history. Um, in the end, it displaced 300,000 people, had over $17 billion worth of damages, and killed 220 people that were basically staying home to stay safe. Um, so all of these crises made Haven always have a very direct kind of approach. So we're an intersectional cultural organization. We are intersectional feminists. We believe in our principles to be as such. So everything that we do is a reflection of that. Any workshop that we hold, we try to create a feminist economy in it where the artists are paid and the workshop attendees come for free. And it creates like a, an endless kind of availability for the arts to be available and for the artists to sustain without creating that crippling uh, weight of surviving in such a landscape. Uh, we opened our third community center, which is open uh, for a week, every, basically all week, uh, except for Mondays, because Mondays is the horrible day of capitalism. So we decided to make it an off day for everybody. Um, and those seven days that were, the other six days that were open were open 10 to 10. And the cultural center is open to the public at all times. We have the only garden you can consider in Lebanon as in a public space for LGBTQI and women and different persons, non-conforming folk and marginalized community members to come be together as artists, as creatives, as radical thinkers, as political movement uh, organizers to have that safe conduit and an incubator, a supporting system and a, basically a backup. Uh, you know, So when you organize, you don't just organize alone. Uh, you need a space to organize. You need the safety that, to be able to organize freely. You need the capacity that sometimes you don't have logistically to, to actually get it done. So what we do is we create as much as we possibly can as an incubation of the court system. We also work, of course, on our awareness campaigns and our advocacy campaigns and our exhibitions and concerts that we hold weekly. Uh, and last but not least is um, because uh, I believe uh, Ahmed is definitely speaking about the archives a lot. Haven is actually creating one of the few correspondents because we we know that for historical purposes, we need to be able to revert back to archive, but when it comes to queer narratives and erasing uh, uh, basically people of color from the global uh, North narrative of how the world has happened and how it's come about and why they're powerful and why some countries aren't, uh, we have reclaimed narratives and we're creating a correspondence of queer artists in the last 30 years for, for five countries within MENA. Um, and these are all visual artists from varying from sculpting to film. And then you have 22 or 27, right? 27 writers corresponding with the artists through a written piece in the book. So uh, these are some of the things we're doing. We can touch back later on. 
That's great, Dana. Uh, wow, you packed it all up very quickly. Um, I want to thank you so much for that. I want to encourage the audience, um, should you have any questions, we might have uh, a few minutes in the end uh, for our esteemed guests. Uh, so if you'd like, please do share your questions in the chat box or the q and I'm not sure. I think one of those uh, is functioning. Um, our tech uh, uh, superheroes here will certainly like forward, us, forward them to us. Um, and with that, let me ask all three of you uh, follow-up questions uh, very quickly. Uh, Khaled, let me let me start with you. Um, I want to ask you about um, Sudan Be Told, uh, the collaboration between um, the young Sudanese Sudanese artists. Uh, if you can tell us about that 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 um, that project um, and uh, give us like a background and how it, has it been functioning, did it, did it do an impact? You know, the whole night. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's exactly what uh, Daniel was saying. We we're trying to reclaim the narrative, right? We're trying to uh, basically, you know, tell the world, tell ourselves that, you know, we always, you know, when you, when you talk about, uh, you know, North Africa and the Middle East, they're always like, you know, it's a mess. So that's, that's always like, oh, you know, it's a mess. It's always been a mess. But no, it hasn't, you know, and we're, we're, we're trying to like figure, figure that out to tell ourselves as well that no, it hasn't been a mess. This is, this is, this is, pretty new and it's not our doing you know so it's um, so for me basically I wanted to do a graphic novel about the history of Sudan and then I thought about it I was like all right but this is going to be my point of view right and then I was like all right so why don't I get other graphic artists to do uh, a graphic novel about the history of Sudan and then I was like well, why graphic artists let's get everybody you know so it was it was a project that started out really small and then ended up really big and from it came a lot of things. So I had 31 creatives from musicians, uh, filmmakers, uh, fashion designers, uh, of course, graphic artists, illustrators, poets, uh, all retell the history of Sudan. So everyone has a chapter and that chapter has to reflect uh, either a period uh, of Sudan's history, uh, uh, a historical figure or a historical event, right? And you reflect that on however way you want to do that and it, we published uh book one and uh, it was a great success uh alhamdulillah and we we all the artists that actually worked on that book did an incredibly amazing work uh during the revolution and still and still are uh now we're working on edition two of uh, sudan retold we're working on an, an edition as well it's called sudan masters which we're working with uh, artists from the uh, older generation yeah 50s and 60s uh 70s and trying to get them also to retell the history of sudan on on, on their own way and uh it was it was incredible because we kind of touched on a lot of issues a lot of uh, history that most of us didn't know like and and it was very fun because I'm a, I'm a political cartoonist and everyone that came to the workshop uh, expected this to be very political. I mean, you know, art, I, all art is political. I definitely believe that. But it's, it was, people were worried because we were also doing, during Bashir time, you know, I was under surveillance. The whole thing was just like, there was like, you know, like everybody was there. All the secret police and stuff were there and stuff. So we were trying to keep it very safe. And uh, so, you know, a lot of the artists, it was very hard to break out of their shell, right? Uh, to make them talk about what they want to talk about. Because sadly, you know, one, one other thing is that when you work in a country like Sudan uh, and many others as well, you, the only people that pay, as I said, is, it's, it's the NGOs or the international uh, organizations who want you to work on certain themes, right? That push their narrative or, or you know, they want you to like work on a case, you know, uh, FJM, uh, uh, colorism, da, 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 right? They don't let you work on what you want to do as a member of this of this community. So break, making artists break out of that, and the, you know this is you have to talk about what you want to talk about, right? And it was it was really incredible because it showed the diversity of Sudan. It showed uh, you know a lot of things, and and from there you know the one of the biggest things that came out of that project was the start of a comic library in Sudan. And I think it's the first comic library probably in East Africa as well. I don't know if there's any other library in, 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 in Africa. So uh, that happened because I was trying to show them uh, examples and I couldn't find any. Like there weren't any comic books in Sudan at all. So 
we grew up with comics. We grew up with translated DC and, and, and Marvel comics, you know, the Egyptian ones and the Lebanese ones. And, you know, we had our own local comics. Uh, there's, there, there, there is that culture, but it stopped, right? And to find these classic things, and but to also add on to uh, what the world is doing right now. So to, to basically play catch up, like this is what we're catch up. Yeah, this is what we're trying to do right now. Uh, I couldn't find any. So I had to basically ask people to send me their comic books to Sudan and I donated my own comic books and then now they're all in in Sudan and you know most illustrators uh, use it well before the coup now you know now it's not really hard to move and stuff uh, this project came out of of, uh, of Sudan Retold uh, another project that came out of Sudan Retold as well was the Sudan Artist Fund so we started an artist fund that uh, basically gives you all you need to do is apply uh, and with your portfolio and the winner will get $500, which is not much at all, right? But you will save these artists from working with uh, the government or or leaving art as a whole and working in something else, or it, it, it will give them some sort of support. And that's, that's what we can afford right now. But the project, the, the Artist Fund has been going on now for six months and it's, it's all based on donation. Uh, and it's like sudanartistfund.com, it's the same, uh, same thing. And then if you want to check out the library as well, it's, it's Sudan Arts and Design Library that, that we're working on. So Sudan Retold really um, motivated a lot, of, a lot of the illustrators, a lot of the, the, the comic book artists, a lot of the artists, creatives in Sudan to move towards telling their own stories and their own narrative, right? And, that's, and I think that's very important in, in, in nation building. It's, and this is what we're all supposed to engage in right now, I mean, it's, it's engaged on right now, especially before the coup, when we were supposed to start, yeah, and the term was a Sudan al jadid you know, a Sudan al jadid the new Sudan, right? New Sudan. And this is what, yeah, the new Sudan, and this is what everybody was trying to work on, uh, you know, but again, the people in power, sadly, even the civilians, let alone the military, even the civilians, didn't see the opportunity that art can give them, can give the people. Right? They're like, okay, now we had the sit-in, you guys had your fun, da, 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 you know, you did the graffiti, you made your songs, great. Now we need to work on the policies, we need to, you know, we need to be a little bit serious, you know, we need to clean up this mess. And now, and, 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 and just like Nadia was saying, yeah, Nadia was saying is they, they, they cleared the street of this graffiti. So now most of the graffiti is deleted and this is our history and it's gone, you know? And the same thing would happen definitely on, on, on YouTube, on, 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 on any other media as well, because it happened to the Syrian revolution as well. Most of the, most of the videos from the Syrian revolution were removed from, from YouTube. So it's, it, sadly, this, this, uh, uh, this collaboration and this, this union between tech bros and, and government is, is really not working on, 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 on our side at all, even though they all, you know, talk the talk about, yeah, you know, we're trying to, you know, democratize and free speech. This is how it started, but now it's moved on to surveillance and moved on. It's exactly where we were with newspapers is now where we are with the internet. Yeah, yeah, it's very sad. Uh, you said something, Khaled, that's very important. Um, and I always complain about this publicly. The discrepancy between what donors want you to work on versus what you need to work on as an artist as an activist, as a lawyer, as a human rights defender, as whatever it is. I know there's a lot of donors um, in RightsCon and the message is to you. Donors, please give these amazing artists here and elsewhere the leverage and the room to work within the confines that you, um, there's, that you place on them. I know you mean well, but uh, in reality, um, you're two steps behind to what is um, to what is uh, needed by artists, activists, and, and, and others. Uh, that messaging is over. Back to Ahmed. Ahmed, I want to probe at the China thing. When you and I were uh, young and reckless downtown Cairo in the mid-2000s, the dream was to get a fellowship in the US or in Berlin or elsewhere. I want to ask you more, not necessarily about the fellowships thing, but how is it now people are gravitating more towards China and, and Russia um, uh, compared to like how when you and I were younger in Cairo, people were gravitating more to the West and now not anymore or less so? If you want to reflect more on that. Yeah, for sure. So basically, 
when when we were growing upstairs, this was another wallet because it was uh, both 9-11 and America and Europe were more interesting on oh, distributing democracy and awareness and blah, 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 and so on. And we saw how this has changed after the Obama administration in American policy and so on. So, of course, uh, the investment from, from not even from government sector, but even from private sector in this region started to cut off and creating vacuum. And this vacuum now is being filled by China and Russia. So there is many level how like China especially are, are, are engulfing and taking over it. Uh, first, um, the, the infrastructure network, for example, in Egypt and most of North Africa now is controlled by China. We witnessed in 2020 how the American government and the State Department warned Egypt for depending on China and building their 5G network and Egypt went through. So now like the infrastructure for if for, for 5G and internet in Egypt is, is totally worked by Chinese government. And in addition to that, we talked about like Chinese, uh, Chinese phone are, are big part of the market in, in, in phones, smartphones and television. Uh, Chinese application uh, and website are taking over audience from Egypt and North Africa. And it going also to many levels, like for example, the fellowship and grants that offered by Chinese government for Egyptian writer and Arabic intellectual is becoming more and more advanced. Like I, I we struggle, like for example, each year there is this program that run at Iowa University in the United States. And literally in the last couple of years, it become more and hard to find an, a writer in Egypt who willing to come here. Uh, because on the other hand, they will go to China. They have China now is running several programs for writers and artists where you go and have a residence for six months in China. And they pay double what Americans are paying. And of course, all those writers are talking about how it's different dealing with Chinese tamam, founder or, uh, uh, and from dealing with Western. Because, yeah, you go to the Western in America and they deal with you as an Arab, Muslim, and blah, blah, blah. But when they go to China, no one asks them this question. No one asks them about, like, tourism or, 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 or uh, no one asks them about tourism or Islam. They are free to exchange and to show their work and so on. So there is more freedom, more money, and this, like, push more artists and writers to go to China and so on. The other level that, for example, China is doing a massive project in the field of media and art. For example, one of the big projects that China has been running is in Africa called the 10,000 Village Project in China, which is a huge project that China is running over 25 countries in Africa. And basically, they will go to, to, to villages in middle of nowhere in Sahara or in Africa, and they will establish like a, a satellite station in this village. And suddenly, people who are living in this village will have access to television and satellite media. And they are doing this across more than 10,000 villages in Africa. Now, what you have also, those people in Africa, suddenly they have access to Chinese uh, propaganda media. And yeah, for example, and, and this also the Chinese media production is taking over the whole Chinese cinema, uh, is taking over the audience, especially in Africa. Uh, if, if anyone following the war between China and Hollywood, for example, uh, Chinese uh, blockstar movie uh, Wolf Warrior uh, made more than one billion dollar. Uh, this is a movie. It's a story. It's basically about this Chinese uh, army officer who will go to retired, who will go to Africa and rescue mission. He will help like the African villages and farmer and rescue them from the bad white American guy, Western guy. Another movie that was blockbuster in African market, of course, it was it called a Chinese movie called Red Sea Mission, which about a Chinese military operation that they did in 2015, where they intervened in Yemen to rescue a Chinese woman and a couple of Arab hostages. So we are watching this movie that the Chinese Marine is entering the Yemen, rescue hostage, civilian and the hostage, tamam. Of course, they, they will not make it clear in the movie, but you see, like, they are bombed by American and Saudis and so on. But they rescue their team and rescue their team. And this is a movie that made over $600 million. Now, 
Hollywood, on the other hand, they are celebrating Top Gun and Tom Cruise Maverick, which for months now did one did like 200 million only, and they celebrated as a huge success. But we are seeing how the Chinese media, especially in cinema, is taking over and over in all levels. Um, and, and, and this is dangerous because like, even for people who are interested in freedom of expression, people who are interested in this media and tech company and making money, this is bad news for, for, for both groups. And we have to, to, to act now and, and came up with more um, uh, creative way in, 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 in dealing with that because Chinese media in the end, they announced it clear. And that's one of the reasons why this African government is cooperating with them. They say, oh, we'll do this satellite in all these villages, but we will follow your order you will follow your regulation as African government and our regulation. So in this TV satellites, you will not only show media, we will not only show media that is pro the government or pro China, but we will cut any media that we don't like. So for example, if a, if a movie or a show promoting like LGBTQ rights, it will not be showing. If even a movie promoting like uh, American national themes, like Top Gun, for example, we will not show it. They will cut scenes from Marvel, other Marvel and Superman movies because like the Statue of Liberty appear in this movie. Um, so, 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 and, and we are seeing this happening also in North Africa and, and Algeria and other countries. Of course, I'm not aware of what they are, I don't have the details of what they are doing also in, in South Pacific, uh, but I believe I'm the read like, especially they are continuing to taking over this market. I, I, I'm sure if they're doing this in Africa, it's being done elsewhere. Uh, and this is really insightful, uh, Ahmed, because it's, uh, I think a lot of people in the West are unaware of the uh, expansion of, of the Chinese media in Africa. Dana, I wanna get back to you. Um, I know you were rushing in the beginning. I know you wanted to talk about your writing, but I also have a follow-up question. So which should we start with? <laughs> Uh, whichever one you want. I just, just well, like, uh, tell us about I your writing first, and then I'm going to ask you the follow up question. Oh, no, no, it's okay. No, just straight, jump straight into that because I'm oh, more right. lingering on the whole Western imperialism is better than you know Chinese imperialism. So, kind of lingering with that. If you'd like to reflect on that, please go ahead before I ask my question. I, I would please. love to. I would love to. So, 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 sure, sure, it sure. comes in multiple modes, especially when you have a far right wing on Facebook. Um, and the way that, uh, you know, uh, certain governments use Facebook to utilize Islamophobia in India and a lot of things that we have in different contexts that mobilize these social media platforms in different way. I believe in, to a certain extent, we cannot say no to this one. And, you know, like, uh, like what happened with Instagram and Facebook and all of them with the war in Ukraine, it was like it was acceptable to say, yes, murder Russians, but, it's, you know, like to a certain extent, as long as you are fulfilling a certain narrative that is conducive of, uh, Western imperialism and, and, and the expansions. I mean, to, to a certain extent, there are some things that we always have to consider in the way that we are trying to reclaim narrative, right? So I'm trying to reclaim narrative from who? Who's had the power for the longest time? Who maintains power? Who utilizes my resources? All of these things. So Anna, for me, these are like, when it comes to art, I feel it's very contentious when we start working on these lines because we always need to remember the nuance in all of this um, and the multiplicity and how governments co-opt our spaces and co-opt our movements using different methods, whether it be NGOs or funding or particular guidelines that they want you to do, because it's all conducive to their narrative and not yours. Um, for me, art is a form of resistance because to a certain extent, it cannot be controlled, right? So there are ways that you obviously can control, as uh, Khaled was mentioning with how artists are being forced and there's no other way for them to live and they're being kind of chased down if they say no, it's more of a life-threatening situation. But when art is out there, when, when a graffiti is put in the middle of a square and people can throw uh, you get to a certain extent where you, there's, because there's no physical entity there, there is a statement there. And that statement can't be washed away after it's been seen, right? And I think that that's the most important thing about the future of art. Um, and when I say Swana region, I say it like Fulham, the, the region here is waking up. We're waking up to Western imperialism. We're waking up to expansionism. We're waking up, of course, we've never forgotten, but I hope the rest of the world wakes up to Palestine. Um, there are multiple layers 
to how narratives are used. And, and like you said, with the movie and the Chinese soldier coming in, we've seen a lot where we were criminalized and demonized and attacked on the basis of being Arab or being a darker skin and not being white enough or not being from the right area or not being from the right region. So my problem is not just with Chinese governments. My problem is governments, as always, utilizing art as another tool to subjugate people under propaganda, lies, and basically misinformation. Um, and that's where the role of the artist also comes in, right? Not just to reclaim narrative, but to also create an alternative narrative that they cannot always refute. Um, Khaled? Sure. Say Khaled, something or? No, no, go ahead. Good. I'll, I'll finish. Well, please continue, Dana, and then we'll go to Khaled. We have, we have a few minutes. Yeah, so, uh, so that's on these kinds of levels when it comes to it. So there's a distinction between history, so to speak, because like in Lebanon, um, our history books stop after the Civil War because they still haven't come to consensus as to what happened in the 1975 Civil War in Lebanon. So from 1975 to 1990, we have zero history. And from then till now, we have no idea. It's kind of like we exist in the ether, like we don't exist as a history. Um, and the problem with it is, is whether we like it or not, our understanding of our communities and our understanding of art and its placement in our societies is very much reflected or passed down to us from the persons in power. And those persons, whether we like it or not, didn't always understand us, our region, our context, or why we fight in a particular way, or why we have to resist in the way that we do. Um, you want to ask okay. something? Yeah, I don't know. I actually, I wanted to turn it over to Khaled before ask. So, because he had a comment, yeah. if that's okay. Yeah, it's, 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 it's absolutely true. You know, it's absolutely true. I mean, look at, look at what the, the Saudis have been doing, right? So ever since the, 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 the new way of Saudi with MBS coming in, it was mostly about art. It was art washing everything, you know? Most artists that I respected, Arab artists, international artists, are all in Saudi now, you know? As, as if nothing is happening, right? This is after the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. This is after Yemen. This is after everything. And if you look at TV, it's the same. It's the same thing as well. I mean, most of most of the Arab world used to watch the news. You know, when Al Jazeera came out, the Arab Spring, da, 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 everyone was in Al Jazeera. But with the fatigue of what was happening, of course, Al Jazeera had its own agendas and pushing of, of, of certain issues as well. Then most people, what do most people watch from Turkey to Morocco? More, what do most people watch? NBC, right? And who controls NBC? Emiratis and the Saudis, right? So the, every narrative that was being pushed right now is, 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 is about that. And it was through art. It was through art. So there is this, this article, I think, written by, I can't remember who, but I'll, I'll find it. It's called Khianat al Muthaqafin. I don't know if that's uh, how to, how to uh, translate that, uh, Rami. How to translate what? Khianat al Muthaqafin. Oh, it's oh, the betrayal of the intelligentsia. Yeah. You know, and that and that's 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 really has to do with what's going on right now. And it's what's and was what we're trying to avoid in Sudan as well. Because at the end of the day, when when you know when the, the army or the junta or whoever is in power enforces that, you know, you have no you have no way. This you have a saying, you have a a, a, a following as an actor or as a Twitter personality or whatever, you're gonna say this or you're gonna disappear, basically. And this is when artists need need to work with that or they, you know, that for, for their safety. And like now, even in Sudan, you see like this poetry of, uh, of this whole huge um, uh, painting of, of, of Hamiti was literally killed people on the street for years. Magnificent painting, you know, and, and someone professional did that. They didn't put their name, you know, but because they know, they know what's going to happen. They're going to be shunned from society, definitely. But they needed to do it. It's, it's at the end of the day, again, it's about support, it's about money, and it's about safety. For sure. No, that's uh, really spot on. But I will say, I will push back and say one thing. That's uh, not as an artist, not like you guys, but as a consumer of art. I definitely believe that art can be bought uh, and artists can be bought in mass. And I think we're seeing that from a lot of stakeholders, whether it's the West or the East or our regional folks. So yeah, just wanted to kind of frame that quickly. We have a couple of questions from um, our uh, audience and uh, so let me start with with, with Dana uh, very quickly um, a question came in asking what are some of the safety precautions you all take uh, when organizing coordinating with Haven for Artists online uh, and how uh, do the online platforms you use support and or not support uh, this kind of work if you want to reflect on that quickly 
Uh, it, it really depends on the campaign itself, on where we feel that the magnitude is mostly going to be, you know, taken. Because each platform does have its strength and its weakness. Um, I mean, when it comes to to art and how you mobilize communities on it, every chant you hear in a revolution is a statement from art, right? So it's just about how you're able to encapsulate that and share it. It's a poet standing in the middle of a, a square and chanting and rallying people behind them. It's a graffiti artist that says. You know, that spray paints that one statement that just, you know, just sticks in your mind for the rest of the revolution. Um, and there are different methods depending on the campaign, such as if you want to not uh, or avoid censorship to a particular degree, you can go to like open source websites and remove any kind of linkages, but just be able to share a 3D art uh, exhibition of a particular art form. Uh, there's some, I believe one is Art Steps and there's another one, I'm not sure what the name of it exactly is. Uh, otherwise, we do uh, digital security trainings left and right every chance we possibly get from whoever can give it at any different interval for every little tweak on the internet because it's so expensive and there's no way you could be 100% digitally safe, but you just constantly have to be up to date with the new you know, possibility. It's a constant struggle for sure. Uh, I feel your pain there when it comes to both the expense and the continuous need to, to adjust and defend. Uh, we have a question uh, from Maurizio Rios. Um, I, it's to all, but I'm going to direct it to Ahmed and I'm going to twist it a little bit. The question reads, if the Arab revolts were happening today, which alternatives to social media would you think would be used to organize, mobilize people in mass? Live, uh, videos. Need... Videos? live videos. Live videos. Live videos. Oh, live okay. videos. And we have witnesses in Egypt and in other uh, uh, countries in the last couple of years, like uh, the most political uh, uh, thing is like if you remember two years ago when Muhammad Ali started what Muhammad Ali was doing was just live video streaming uh, lately also many uh, Arabic activists who like in exile or inside would use live video and people are using live video for many reasons first of all live video can be interrupted if you are in live video you could say any shit to them and it will take Sometimes hour for algorithm to catch you and and close it you. Uh, the second thing, it it you got the notification. Everyone taking the notification. If they are following you in Twitter and YouTube, they have the notifications that you are live, so they can press and enter. This doesn't exist in other things. The other step, it create interactive between the person and the people, so it helps them to organize. That's why like people will have live video and will. People will interact. What should we do? Oh, go to the street or do things and blah, 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 blah. And we have witnessed this like even in, 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 I witnessed something like that last year in Lebanon, where there were protests in Lebanon. People were using a lot of live videos and streaming and then documenting uh, uh, the stuff. So, and the take, it, 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 it creates an event, it creates a message, and on the other side, the government and the algorithm, it will take them hours and even days to reach out or catch you and, and to pant. So I believe it's it's live videos that is the future. And also other shared uh, applications that is secure and encrypted, like Signal, Telegram, and so on. Brilliant answer. I, I love that, that video, it makes a lot of sense. Khaled, I'm going to ask you a question that is also from the audience. Um, and feel free to reflect however you wish. Uh, also, just noting that we have seven minutes left. The time flew by. Uh, Khaled, the question reads, how do you see social media playing a role in curbing freedoms uh, of speech or artists? Do you, see, do you see that happening at all? Or do you see it only as something that promotes? No, I see. I mean, it personally happens to me, right? I mean, I did a couple of cartoons that were taken down from Facebook, taken down from Instagram, uh, Twitter, not so much, but it was mostly Twitter, Facebook and, and Instagram. And of course, it's community rules and uh, you have to uh, then, you know, contact them and they reply back and then, you know, all of these things. But it's it's um, it's definitely a sort some sort of uh, censorship um Tool. Would you care to tell us that, that about these cartoons more, just uh, for the yeah. audience? Yeah, so uh, the, the the latest one was the one on the killing of uh, a journalist, uh, Shireen Abu in, uh, in Palestine. And uh, the cartoon was taken down within hours, right, um, for community community rules. Um, so that's, that, that's, that's the latest one. In, um, in, on Facebook, it was uh, something about Trump, 
I can't, I can't remember, but I think it got a lot, it reported a lot uh, <laughs> and then it was taken down. But it's also, you know, the, a huge, a huge issue is not only that, uh, you know, the straightforward community rules that we taking your picture down is also the shadow banning, right? So like you, there's a lot of issues that you can't talk about. And if you talk about it, you're just going to get lower views, uh, lower uh, uh, um, communication. And, and it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not going to get to people. That's the thing, and I and I see it, you know, because you can see the stats, like you can see this is going down, and it's not and it's not happening. And like like what happened in Sheikh Jarrah, for example, for people to bypass the 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 the, the censorship of Instagram, people started writing Arabic with no dots. This didn't happen in thousand four hundred years, you know. So it's this is this is how great creativity kind of leads the way into jumping over censorship. And this is what what happened ten years ago with the Arab Spring, when social media started. And now this is what's happening with social media being exactly where, where we were 10 years ago. You know, we have to kind of work around it. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's very true. I'm glad that you referenced uh, the writing with, with no dot Arabic. Uh, obviously, for people that don't speak Arabic that are joining us, um, letters uh, have dots that identify uh, the letter itself. So removing the dots... Um, if for the trained eye, you can't read it for an Arabic native speaker, but uh, for an algorithm, of course, it couldn't. So that's that was the bypass that Khaled was was speaking about. We have four minutes left. Um, I'd like to give each of you a minute uh, to perhaps uh, closing remarks, uh, thoughts, um, and and if if you will tell us what is needed or what are your thoughts about moving forward in your own space, uh, that would be great. Uh, and Dana, I'll uh, start with you. Um, what is needed? That is a big question. Asking someone in Lebanon. One minute. Very much. One minute. Uh, so, <laughs> so when it comes to art in particular, I think the first thing that we need to come to terms with is creating at least an Arabic terminology that is inclusive. The wording that was emitted from particular spheres to include the persons that were otherwise pushed out. And as far as it comes down to it, it's really pushing towards transnational solidarity. I know Sudan, I know everything that's happening about the coup every single day. Like we need to know what's going on with our brothers and sisters every possible place, you know? Uh, we need to be able to not just push and amplify their situations and be aware of the situations, but we be aware of how the, those situations are being pushed out with misinformation. That will allow us to be able to motivate, to be able to mobilize together, organize, and have clarity and awareness around different situations and how they even came about. Great, awesome. Nagy? Well, the, the only thing for, for, for from my side is like, especially for, for tech company and NGOs that work on expressions that, especially for tech money, if uh, for tech companies, if you want to do money out of this market, you have to move toward this freedom of expression and you have to cooperate with the NGOs and you have to follow a clear and transparency agenda with, with your audience, especially in Middle East and North Africa. Because, yeah, you maybe gain money, gain, make some money out of like collaborating with this regime now uh, 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 in Middle East, but this situation will not continue. You already lost the market. You lost the market in, in Russia after the war because of American sanction. And any day, you don't know what will happen tomorrow, for example, between America and China. China could easily block you from all their phone. Like if, if you, if, if, yeah, if you block Chinese mobile phone from Android and Google and Apple and Apple market, China also using a million and million of people in North Africa and Africa is using Chinese mobile phone now and depending on Hawaii market. China also could easily block you. You have to act now, act fast with a clear political agenda because this is not only about money. That's, that's only my speech. Spot on. Khaled, 30 seconds. Sorry, wrapping it up. Solidarity, just like Nina said, uh, absolutely solidarity, solidarity, solidarity and support artists that's, that need support. Uh, safety for artists. I mean, there is no freedom without freedom of expression, and there's no freedom without freedom of speech, and you need art to do that. Amen, brother. Absolutely. Uh, Dana, Khaled, 